check, check, nine, check, niner. I take it down a little low and bring it up on high to emphasize excitement. This is Evan's speaking voice, niner. <laughs> Hey, welcome to Motorbike Mondays, episode 9. This is Evan from Race Tech Electric. Uh, this is Brady Young from Seaweed <laughs> and Gravel. <laughs> <Our> I almost <laughs> said from San Diego, California. <laughs> and this is Jared from uh, San Diego, California. Do we need to use and last seaweed names and gravel. Now? Like, I didn't use my last name. Is that a thing? Brady just, always uses his last it. name. No, that was the first I time. Know. I don't think he ever That has. was the first time, and I actually... And he, like, uh, really seems to fear change, too, so I'm wondering why. Super hey, fear I just change. had two cans of Mountain Dew before I got here. <laughs> I'm all hopped I'm a, up on the Dew! I'm a whole new man. So, you get jacked on Mountain Dew, and then you use your full name? For <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. It's pretty wild. Uh, so this is the new episode. We are actually videotaping with uh, Evan's Christmas present. Um, yeah, what we're doing today? Shiny new yeah. camera over there. Hey, hi, camera. We're actually using a videotape. Yes, really yes, we are videotaping. It's a shoulder VCR. Yeah, exactly. My dad had one of those. Yeah, I dude, was a, I had one growing up. My it, dad did. It was the it, best thing in the world. It actually used a VHS. Yeah, yeah, tape, yeah. You know, like the oh yeah, tape in the, side. the massive one. It was crazy. I think my dad actually still has it. Yeah. We have it's one. Amazing. It was a Panasonic. Too. We have one too. Um, mm. I think it too. even had like he had like a backpack battery for it. Yeah, like, the battery didn't last. Yeah, all exactly. Long, so he got this extra one. You could like clip on your boots yeah. or whatever and like run this cable up to it. It yeah, was really it was great. Ridiculous. Yeah, a lot of home movies. Oh yeah, uh, it ended already. The card. Oh, the battery's dead. That was just a warning. Wow. Yeah. Should we start this one over now? No, we're good. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so what do we usually do next? What's in the shop? Or yeah, hey, well, now? first, let's. You want to apologize? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, so we, we took sorry, a, we've been we lagging a, a lot. Um, so we got in an argument, broke up for a couple weeks. It was really rough. Over the holidays, you know, it's just bad drama. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, holidays, everybody has their own thing going on, and we've just been super busy getting into the new year. <laughs> now that it's, yeah. like, two weeks past yeah, the now holidays. That it's, it's January. Well, we I can't mean, really like squeeze 15. that. We're, st- we're starting the new year and everything, and, and we couldn't upload anything the first week or whatever. No, oh, yeah. that's, that's bullshit. That's well, just, these are just all excuses. We just lagged. We were unable. Our, yeah, our like, schedules weren't lining up too properly. So They don't know their excuses, so we just maybe they'll buy it. We'll just say that we had all sorts of... We got I, called in on some... Like two shoes over here already blew really it. really so. important... We practice honesty in my home. <laughs> honesty is the only policy. I prefer lying, so we got called in on <laughs> some really important government work, and now we're back. Yeah, so here we are. Uh, episode nine. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about building um, a custom wiring harness, like in depth, because we, we kind of covered it before, but we yeah. had a lot of people that wanted to hear more about it. So we're gonna we're gonna focus on that tonight and give you a lot more info about it. But first, um, let's read the emails first, and yeah, then I think that's what we usually yeah, do. I think that is right. So first, we're going to uh, read some of our emails and comments and stuff. Um, some comments on the website. Um, let's see here. The latest one was we had some emails from a dude named Evan Brady, which is great. Which is name. Pretty cool. Is your middle name Jared by any chance? <laughs> um, I'll have to ask him that. I actually had a teacher, uh, elementary uh, teacher, whose last name was Brady. So she was Mrs. Brady, <laughs> and that was extremely uncomfortable. Why was that uncomfortable? Well, because every time I heard the name Brady, which is not a common name, so I hadn't like hadn't normalized to me like some dude named John, whose every dude's name is John. So every time I heard Brady, I would look around and I'd be confused. I was just an awkward little kid, anyways. That, yeah, that must have been. I rough. still am. Must have been rough. My third what, grade teacher. Grade? Yeah, I think it was second grade. <laughs> Um, okay, anyways, Evan Brady said, uh, I love your show and listen every week. I live in Tampa Bay, and I have a 75 CB550. I got a few months back, and I have many things to do on it. This is my first time doing anything like this. I want to get a regulator rectifier as a single unit to replace mine. Where can I purchase one? 
Also looking to buy uh, pod filters for the carbs if you have any suggestions. And P.S. Yes, my name is really Evan Brady. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> um, I already emailed Sorry, you Jared. back and said, <laughs> give me a call for the regulator rectifier. I make them for those bikes. Um, I think I'm currently out of stock on the single overhead cam regulators, but I have plenty of the XS650 regulators, which are identical. Um, the wire color is different, but they're identical parts. So anyways, I think I already told you that in an email, but get in contact with me at racetechelectric.com and we'll take care of it. What about pod filters? You guys ever use them? Where do you get them? Yeah, mm-hmm. um, you can get K&N ones uh, or you can just get the generic ones. There's a bunch of different kinds. Um, yeah. Um, you can, I mean, if you don't want to leave your house, eBay is always good. Yeah. If you have like a local motorcycle store, um, they'll carry like some generic, mm. uh, like MGO pod filters, or maybe they'll have uni filters. Um, you just got to make sure you <laughs> measure your carbs and get the Look right at Tom size. Hanks. Tom Hanks is pumping. <laughs> is he pumping your arm? Yeah, he likes me, man. Dude, it's coal trickle. Yeah, you just got to, <laughs> you have to know what size, um, filters you need so i believe on the 550 they are 49 or 39 no. millimeters yeah i don't remember i forget every time i think uh, they're 39 millimeter of, inlet yeah if you um, have a set of uh calipers yeah. uh just jump on there and measure the um the intake uh side of For the most carbs bikes, i wouldn't be surprised if you did a google search Oh, yeah, usually. You probably yeah. already I constantly it. forget and say if I'm not at the shop to actually measure them. I, I just Google do a quick shop. Google search, like, yeah, just uh, whatever bike and then pod size, yeah. and they'll they'll come up. Yeah. So, especially it, on on the uh, a, a very common bike as a as a fi- CB550. Yeah. They oh, and be year fun. specific too if you aren't doing it because oh, yeah, uh, the, the, carbs, the carbs change. the right. carbs Different. did change. If uh, I, I believe one year I think it was sixty or seventy seventy six I think seventy six they changed carbs. Yeah. How picky are um, the CBs about putting oh, pod not bad. Well, yeah. the one you thing that have you have to that you have to pay attention to, especially if you're going to get like the cone pod filters, yeah. is their length. Um, yeah, oh. the, because the, the two outside ones, one and four, they have to be like under two and a half inches long. So I know they hit the frame, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They hit yeah. The frame. I'm looking at uh, Jared's got a CB five. What is that a five? Five fifty in here right now, and I am looking at it. You can definitely see it. There's totally a cl- would be a clearance issue if the filter's too long. Yeah, so yeah. I think they, they do make cylinders. smaller ones. They're a little dip- more difficult to find. Um, they make ones that look like pucks too, that are just like flat pancake right. ones. Yeah. Um, I like the cone a little better. I think they look. I'm better. starting to I'm like not, just the uni pod filters yeah, these days. The, the foam, foam filters. filters. I'm not. I've never really been too particular of of pod filters. Uh, what do you general, need to do on those bikes to compensate for it? Do you need to rejet on those? Sometimes, it's, yeah. I mean the the main thing, like if you just get if you're just doing like um, on this bike. I mean every bike kind of tunes differently. Cause right, the carbs are different. Well, I'll say this right now: when I put those pods on that bike, I didn't have to touch jetting at all. Really? Yeah, yeah. and it was fine. I know some bikes are like that, but for like like the CV like carb types, those oh, are a little a bit hassle. more. Yeah. That's that's a but slide, right? for uh, for like say your your CB five fifty, um, they rejetting doesn't necessarily take place until um, you start messing with the exhaust. The exhaust has a lot more effect on jetting right. than uh, the intake. Well, okay, no, you can right. get away with stock jetting CB. with like maybe richening your uh, pilot screw. I remember the GS, the Suzuki GS seven fifty. I've had two of those. And I put pod filters on one of them, and that thing plain would not run at all with the stock yeah. jets in it at all. Well, because those those nightmare. function off of uh, velocity, uh, like air velocity, yeah, air open up the slide, the, no, and so you're had, changing. That thing was a, it was a seventy seven, I think, and it had a set, it had a rack of carbs like that. They were mechanical. Oh, really? Because I thought the same thing. And I remember I had to put the stock airbox back in, and it didn't even run right because the airbox, the rubber seal on it, was bad. So you were that having you had intake so leaks. unbelievably picky. No, it was it was not like, um, not not like the boots on the carbs. Like it was actually the that airbox on that GS had a little um, uh, like 
the the actual part that the intake, the part that let air into the box, was it had like a little rubber flap that was kind of angled to direct. It sucked air yeah. from the bottom, and it had a tear in it, and like it sucked in extra. So it really just let in more air than it was designed to. And just that, the bike literally would not run uh, hmm. until I see. I had to use silicone and seal the whole thing up. It was, anyways, it was a nightmare. But you can get if you the can CBs get the pods are, are not as picky about it. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with the CB550 and any bike, you just want to check your clearances, do the research, like on any forum, you know, you can find what size pods you need. Yeah. yeah. People and will say what problems they've ran into with mm-hmm. running them. Yeah. And I generally, I, I usually run like a millimeter smaller size. Uh, that way it's kind of a little bit more snug, a little, yeah. And you can, you can fit them on. It's a little bit more work, but it's kind of a little extra sealed. It may have not, I mean, when you clamp them down, I mean, you're sealing them down pretty good, but it just makes me feel better. I'm glad you feel better. Thank you. (laughs) It's important. Um, Mike, uh, this guy, Mike Conte, um, he, he'd sent us a couple emails. We've been talking, we've answered. He was the guy that was talking about bent frames, but he, he actually sent another message. He posted a comment on the website and sent some links to a CB forum, SOHC4.net. And they, uh, I can't find the link. Now. Oh, here it is. That's this, a pretty big forum. This guy it's actually, so this dude, he, he made this like gigantic thread of a ground up, like nuts and bolts restoration of a single cam 750 or something. Oh, it's 550. Anyways, long story short, it's a long thread. I've seen that on a t-shirt. Um, yeah, yeah. Somebody, yeah, he's like a photographer, I think. But um, it, anyways, it ended up, he went through a like, really detailed restoration on this bike and it ended up having a bent frame that he discovered at the end of it oh, because no stuff didn't line up like it was a bunch of small things that he finally ended up figuring out it was the frame so mike was just sending a link to that and saying hey check this out like it happens yeah. more than you think huh. anyways the Maybe links are on our website really lucky since uh we've been going through bikes yeah i don't i mean it, anyways the the links are on the website in the what's in the shop page, um, you can see the links that Mike posted. They're kind of interesting. There's some good threads on there. So I well, guess cool. it's more of a problem than we knew. Yeah. Um, let's see here. We have some emails. Um, let me start here with Will. Um, I'll, well, I'll answer this in an email. This is some detailed questions about testing a regulator. We've kind of gone over that stuff, so I won't go into that. Um, he did say in, let's see, in other topics, Jared said he was going to be installing some moto gadget devices to a bike. Is he, ta- is he talking about all the electrical stuff? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I'd be interested in hearing about that as straightforward as it seems since I recently picked up an M unit along with four buttons to control everything. No keyless ignition for me, though. Um, so he, I mean, I don't think you've done it yet, right? But I actually, like to know about I, it. I, I, after talking with the client, um, we what, decided. Remind me, what is that again? <clears throat> okay, well, the, there's this company called it's like Moto a key Gadget, fob. and oh, they it's make it is it it is it's a key fob essentially, like yeah. with a security door. Well, kind of. so that's right, yeah, that's that's, right. that's the M lock, and that's what I was gonna install, and that's what he said he didn't install. But they also make this thing called the M unit, which is basically a very smart terminal block. Um, like a breaker, uh, yeah. breaker bar. Yeah. Wait, is it, not breaker bar, is it remote controlled? No, 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 no. It's so hardwired in. Okay. So what does it do then? It, it's like a fuse wired. panel. Yeah. It's a fuse it's panel. It's a smart one. And it, it lights, lights up and it like tells you like what's like running, like and what's working when it's going. Got it. It's like 300 bucks. So it's like got LEDs on it or something. Yeah. 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 Oh, interesting. And, uh, so I wasn't going to run that. I was only going to run the, the, the M lock. We decided not to do it just because it wasn't what we thought it was. Um, but I don't really have any other experience with that Moto Gadget stuff. Uh, I had only found it and was contemplating using it. So sorry about that, man. Can't well, really help you out there. We'll update if we ever have any experience with it. Um, let's see. Tim, I, uh, we emailed with him a little bit, um, but I'll read this real quick so Brady can comment on it. Um, Tim in Australia said, um, let's see, he listened through Episode 8. He's from Sydney, Australia. And he enjoys the podcast. Awesome. Um, <laughs> let's see. He was asking. Cool, under the breath, awesome. Awesome. <laughs> well, it is awesome. It 
It is cool. He Thank was you. mentioned um, he wanted to hear more about making a wiring harness from scratch, so we're going to talk about that. Um, he said, uh, so something else if you could tell me about some more detail on the seat from the black CB550, the brown leather flat two-seater. He wants yeah. to do something similar about it. So I had emailed him back and then forwarded it to Jared. Who, I emailed him to you. Yeah, Jared gave him some um, info on it, but... You want to add anything on that bike? Uh, I think I read those emails. I think Jared pretty much explained it. Uh, as far as like the seat, um, it's pretty much all all. It's a custom seat pan, and it was a seat pan that was pretty much fitted to that bike. Um, all or, of our seat pans yeah, are. All of our seat pans are kind of custom built and tailored to each bike. Um, so, um, it, a simple process doing that. I mean, just get some get some cardboard or poster board poster board I, I prefer just because it's still kind of rigid and um and it's it's thin and, and easily malleable um and just make your template off of that and um transfer it to some sheet metal 16 gauge should be sufficient um i wouldn't do anything thicker than 16 yeah gauge. yeah exactly Especially if, if you have any in it, it's, yeah it's gonna it's gonna fight you um, and your you, it won't lay down when mounted down uh, when it's mounted uh, to strong yeah, yeah. to uh, uh, follow the contour of the frame. So you do um, a, a cardboard template first. Is that yeah, you yeah. Do a cardboard template. Like most things, when you're dealing with metal, um, it's it's it kind of gives you an idea of what not only what it's going to look like, but it's an easy transfer. So you don't have to run back and forth, grind right. a little here, grind a little there. Right. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, transfer it to metal. And then, um, mounting is another thing. I mean, there, that's, I think it's going to be a little too long to explain that. I mean, but it's, there's many ways to mount it. Um, and, uh, and then, um, from there, I mean, it's pretty much the two up seat, for that bike is pretty straightforward, pretty simple, and then uh, it's off to the polster after that to get foamed and and then upholstered. So, well, there you go, Tim. Um, let's see here, Alfred. Oh, but there there will likely be some modification to the frame to allow it to sit flat. Oh yeah, because the what your the seat pan you're laying on top. Um, of the frame right um is usually covered by the seat the stock seat pan kind of curves around it's, it it's a little molded bit inside yeah. and it curves around the yeah seat. so i mean just kind of there's a few options you can kind of leave it leave um uh you can either like the, as far as the rear of the frame you can hoop it um or you can uh kind of just work around it where you just kind of shave it flat um, and uh, you want to uh, like in the back of the frame there's a little um, kind of cross member it's like an goes, upwards um, brace yeah, kind of thing um, you want to uh, go back and and uh, resupport that um, to uh, make sure the the frame doesn't flex um, so that it is it is essential that you reinforce the the rear of the frame so you don't have any flexing because of the shock load goes straight to those points, and you want to make sure. And then you get no bent there. frames. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you need to connect your frame in the rear somehow. Yeah. Um, Alfred said, I really like your podcast. It delivers a lot of great usable information. The electrical section was really good. Awesome. Sick. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would be Are interested. You tooting your own horn over there, or what? <laughs> no, he was making fun. Of I me. would be interested <laughs> in knowing what model and year uh, Harley Sportster you would look for and not get upside down. Um, I can answer that. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> an expert on Harley stuff. What's good I don't think any for? of us are Harley experts. Um, I have a, a Sportster. Uh, I got a 2004 Sportster Roadster. Um, I got a 2000. Four because it was the first year of the shock mounted motor or the rubber mounted motor and sportsters are notorious for just shaking you to death um mm. and well i had ridden like a couple different ones and test rode them like pre pre 2004 and then and they were just it didn't do anything for me like my 
CB550 could keep up with it. I had an 87, and it was a death trap. That bike would have been better off upside down in the middle of the street. Yeah, so I got the... I don't know. I've had completely different experiences. Crappiest bike I have ever... I got the 04 Roadster. Um, My friend had one, and I rode it, and it was, like, insane. It was... I loved it. So I got it, and I got a really good deal on it. Um, But, I mean, you're... It's going to be hard. I mean, you're not going to be upside down in it. It depends on what you want to spend. Um, but, and I would stay carbureted too if you if you want to work on your bike. So 2004 to 2006, I believe. Yeah. Um, 2007, Sportster changed to fuel fuel injection, or maybe it's 2008. I I don't know the year of fuel injection. <coughs> but um, it's it, probably but, around there. Yeah. That yeah right. But uh, I mean, the thing with Sportsters is everybody wants a Harley, but not everybody can afford a Harley, and that's what the Sportster's for. So that it's a really good bike, but they're also very abused. Yeah. Um, because people will just get them, and they'll ride the shit out of them, and they won't take care of them. So I you would say be spend careful. a little... If you're going to go with the Sportster, you know, not that you want to be upside down on the bike, but I would probably spend a little more money on those as opposed to getting a cheaper one. Uh, it, it, with any bike i think it, it kind of depends you like want if to cover your ass you want to get it checked like if you're if you don't know anything about bikes like take it somewhere a good mechanic that you might know or a harley mechanic or something and have them do an inspection yeah on it. and right. i i would agree with that uh, if it was say like under the assumption that he just wants to get on it and ride around right but if you're playing like uh to do like a build out of it, like say you want to hardtail it, do some stuff like that. Um, I think it would be more beneficial to find one that pretty much isn't even running right. or just kind of junked up. And well, then since um, asked, I, I agree with Brady on that one. He too. asked about not being upside down on it, so I'm assuming he's looking to go get a bike and hop on it yeah. and ride, you know? Well, Doesn't I mean, at the same like time, it, to me, it. that sounds like more so um, he's going to be investing into it, and at the end, he wants to like be able to, like, pull out oh, of it yeah because uh, yeah, for the most part be. i mean it, it, if say you're running around on a running stock bike you're you're dependent on just the holding value of the market on right. those bikes and so and, chances are you're not going to get back what you put into and it. and the so. thing with harleys too is everybody who's going to sell you one is going to tell you that harleys have always been above book value which like uh, you're going to yeah. look at blue book value yeah. on a harley and it's going to be like Say, like, Blue Book value on the bike that I bought was, like, four grand. And I couldn't find one for cheaper than $6,500. Really? Yeah. Wow. And, uh, well, the one I bought, I got, well, I, yeah, you bought, I like, got the, it for four grand, but yeah. I drove, like, 400 miles Blue to Book get it. is usually, like, ridiculously high. Right. But Harley's, like, That's every Har- every Harley person you talk to will tell you the same thing. Well, Harley's have always been above Blue Book, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. I don't know. But yeah, that's uh, that's what I would. I mean, that's what I went with. Well, it's like anything stuff. else. It's price and condition. Do your homework and find a good deal. Yeah, um, but yeah, definitely. Uh, and you, also, rebuilding those um, motors are super simple. Um, and I mean, yeah, parts are definitely more expensive because it is a Harley. Um, but uh, to rebuild, like say, do a top end rebuild. If you do it yourself, you're probably looking at like two. To three hundred bucks in parts, um, and at that point, I mean, you you should have a pretty solid running bike too, as long as you do your homework, do your your research, and and know what you're doing, and make sure it's going back together right, and you're not missing anything where you're going through it. So, I mean, at that point, what's really going to, um, uh, I, I'd say, generally. Um, holds you from getting money back is is a running condition and how um uh if uh if i, I lost where i was going on this yeah damn it <laughs> get but, a, just find a, find a good deal yeah. but if you if you don't know those bikes specifically it would probably be very smart to have somebody Mm. Um, that does know them better go with you or you yeah know, knows what to look for as far as um uh, as far as years and stuff like that, um, 84 was the last year of the Ironhead, uh, yeah. which is, 
kind of a troublesome motor. Um, I've owned one, and I, I've got all the bugs worked out, and it was, at the end of the day, it was a solid running bike, but... Um, it only took you one day? Just <laughs> at, at the at the end of the, the last day. <laughs> the last day. The um, last day. <laughs> but uh, Evos, to be honest with you, they, they, they kind of have been pretty solid running bikes. Um and it's kind of it's funny now. Like I, I'm planning on doing a cross country trip in the in the near future, hopefully. And I thought to myself, you know what? I'm, I'll probably do that on a Harley because I want something more reliable than my old Japanese motorcycle. And so, if that means anything to you, um, really, that's that would not be my first thought. <laughs> well, they're for easy to work on. <laughs> they're super easy to work on. You can jerry them to work. But I've never had one that's reliable. My experience with them has been horrible, but that's always because I bought junk. So. Yeah. <laughs> My bike's been super reliable. <laughs> yeah. I, I bought it in, like, September, and I've put, like, 4,000 miles mm-hmm. on it already. Like, I ride yeah. it every day. I mean, regardless, I mean, you are going – any bike, you are going to be working on it. Uh, or it's going to need maintenance and, and all that. So it's, as far as, like, does it need any more, probably – I, I'd say it, it's tough to say on that one, but uh, if you're not doing the work yourself, you're going to get charged more to service. Yeah, because it's just because it's a Harley. Yeah, especially if you take it to Harley to get service. Yeah, yeah don't sure. do that. Um, um, but there's a lot of good independent mechanics. Yeah, in yeah, yeah, as well. Mom and know? mom and pop shops know, you know they they can do the same thing. Mm-hmm. And it's a lot cheaper. Right. But I would say as far as. Um, say like if you're in the, the Evo, uh, Sportster range, like I would, st- I prefer the pre 95s because it's still chain drive. You can convert them to chain drive, um, uh, if it is a belt, but it's just kind of one less thing you have to do. And, and for the like most part, fifty bucks, the Sportster has very, has changed very little, um, since it came out. Um, the only major change is the rubber mounted engine. Well, with the Evo. Yeah. Um, and, and so when you're looking at it that way, like might as well buy a little older, um, because you can save some money on there. Right. Um, and, um, and yeah, I mean, it's, so well, that's, and then that's also, kind of, uh, 89 or 90 was the first year that it was, became a five speed. Oh, speed yeah. to a five speed. Oh, that's and good. So yeah. you're, if, if you're, you're going to want the five speed. Yeah. I would definitely not get a four speed. It's a XL, XLH, a hugger is what is what the, the model was. And that was the four speed. And then, um, I don't know. Just look at, like, they have so many different trim packages for the Sportsters. Like, even now, you know, like a Nightster is a Sportster. Yeah. Uh, a Roadster is a Sportster. Yeah. You know, they have the custom. They have the low. And it's all the same motor. It's all this with just a little bit different tweaks, like right. trim packages. Right. Um, I, I would say don't even pay too much attention to that stuff, unless you have your. Unless that's set, what you like, want. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. so, then we're we're having a different conversation. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's basically um, what I'd say. All that spend stuff. Spend a lot of time on that. Yeah, that was <laughs> good info on Sportsters. Uh, okay, Alan. Should have called Ryan. Alan. <laughs> 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 no. BMW, Ryan. No. no. Oh. Um, okay, Alan said, thanks for your podcast. I had a quick question if this motorcycle was a good novice motorcycle to fix up or would I be getting a bike that has too many problems? I'm going to post the – I'll post this on the website, the pictures in the description of this. I'll kind of describe it to you. It's it's on a classifieds website somewhere. I, this guy's in like Kansas City or something. Um, so for 1000 bucks, it's a 1981 Honda CB650C custom and um, the guy calls it a custom build. So I'll post the pictures. It's very interesting. Um, yeah, his very. description says, I have a 1981 CB650 custom uh, build motorcycle. I purchased this bike with only the frame and the motor that did not run and have built it to this point. My investment into this bike has been about 3500 for parts to build it up and make it function as well as clearing the title. I do have the title in hand. At this point, the bike does not work yet, but needs only a few things to ride. I have listed what it needs. The motor has run. It needs a new head gasket due to the top end having some work done and now does not hold compression for the inner two cylinders. It usually goes the other um, way around. The lights all work, but need resistors for the turn signals, and the regulator went out, but I have a new one just not installed. The wiring needs to be cleaned up, as I did have to build a harness for this bike to get it running and functioning. 
I should listen to our podcast. <laughs> um, the gas tank is also gummed up this winter, so it needs to be cleaned out, and the paint finished as well as touching up. Also, a new battery, and that's all that it needs to get running. Um, anyway, so then there's some pictures of it. It's pretty interesting. It's um, kind of ridiculous. Yeah. It's really weird combination of parts. Um, it's got a exhaust like it's got. Probably stock pipes running to a muffler off like a GSXR 1000 or something. <laughs> I don't even know what that can is. Um, it's got a really weird uh, air filter intake system. Looks like he tied all the carbs together and ran them out to like a Harley style. No, that's like a Honda intake. Civic bike. Huh? Yeah. Like oh, Honda I guess the filter is, huh? Filter. I mean, I was thinking. Well, you can buy that at AutoZone, like right yeah. off the shelf. That's so weird. It's got an inverted front end. I wonder if yeah, it's did got the neck nice bearings correctly. Yeah, um, it's got sport bike front end on it. From that guy's got way more newer than dollars in parts. Well, who knows? I mean, you, it's you know, it's got some nice reservoir shocks on the rear. Oh, Actually, the those. swing arm. Look, the swing arm's been changed. Yeah, does that look like it? Yeah, it does. Um, there's a lot of really interesting stuff that's been done. It's got a whole bunch of like it's machined it aluminum cool. parts on it. Um, it's just weird. It's a really weird combination of parts on this thing. I'll post all the pictures. Yeah. I'd love to hear your anybody else's comments oh, on those it. Are, that's a stock swing arm. Is it's, it? He's yeah, got yeah, a yeah. step up on the shocks in the rear. Yeah. Um, Probably to make it mo- to we make it work because the stock Honda is a clevis, and the shocks are probably eye to eye, and stock Honda is eye to clevis. It could be that, or just to 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 raise it, raise it up a little bit. Huh. Well, yeah. anyways, it's interesting. Look at the pictures. I, don't know. I mean, um, for what he definitely does have, like he's got some money into it with parts that are on it. Yeah, for um, sure. Thirty five hundred's probably could be thousand bucks. I mean, it's not. I mean, in my eyes, it's not very desirable. No. Uh, but for a thousand bucks, kind of like raises some flags. Well, okay. For if it was me, I would not buy it. No. I would but, not buy it either. Especially if he says that he's. Um, a novice motorcycle to fix up. Yeah. So I would not start with a project like yeah, that. Yeah, definitely because not. finding help and resources is going to be difficult because of how many things that have been changed. And yeah. you have no idea how good any of the custom work was done. Yeah, and it's, and it's, it's something like this. Like t- the, It's obviously been gone through, and um, it's not necessarily going to help your learning too much as you go because you're dealing – you're – uh, it's all based on if this guy did it right, right. or not. Yeah. And You're there's just, some questionable things going on, even how he explains some things, why it's not running. The, well, the whole, like, not run, but it has does not hold compression on the inner cylinders because of work or head work yeah. that was done or something. Like, what? Exactly. That, that's a red flag right there. Um, Because you have no idea what that means. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it looks like you're going to have to be doing a lot of fixes that the previous owner or this owner has done even to – that kind of needs a little bit of, like, base knowledge of, like, what right. it should be um, Well, I would first. look at it this way. This guy it dumped that much money into this bike and, and then, then is taking it. that big of a dive yeah. on it. I mean, Off the bat, that's before anybody gives him an offer. Mm-hmm. So there, if you could get it yeah, for $200, it I would buy it offer. and part it out. Yeah. That probably means that he got in maybe over his head or he ran into all sorts of problems with it and he's just trying to cut his losses mm-hmm. and get out. That's, you know, but it's got cool parts on it. Like, you know, it's certainly for parts wise to piece it together could be valuable. But if yeah. you're a new guy, like starting out trying to learn this stuff, probably yeah, not. You don't want to take stuff. over someone else's nightmare. Cause then it, it becomes exactly that. And then you're going to be doing the same thing, right. trying to unload it like this guy is. And you weren't the guy that did all this yeah. work to begin with. So you might get mm-hmm. in over your head real quick. I, it, on, it would be a lot easier to find a, a bike that is just completely run down that hasn't been really touched. Yeah, that right. has everything yeah. there. Right. The, everything's there, but not running, just looks like crap, and kind of you, no one would give it a second look. You'd be better off starting off like that. I would suggest that to anyone to learn yeah. because that forces you to go through everything. And is this something that, like a hobby you want to continue doing or something you want to keep investing into? Right. Then the best way to fi- to learn is just by jumping into the fire and and you'll know everything about that bike when you're done. Yeah. 
Exactly. So. Well, that covers all our comments and emails. Um, let's uh, talk about what's in the shop. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish the video was running just so everybody can see Brady shake his head. Yeah, yeah no, I'm on it. Brady's that. not a fan of that. Um, well, I'll start. Uh, I have, let's see, I've got an XR400 in the shop right now fixing up. Uh, it's got an old, old, old Baja Designs dual sport kit on it with a bunch of little problems. So I'm just going through and fixing all that stuff up to get all his lights working right. It's a cool bike. I love yeah. the, yeah. I love plated XRs. Yeah, they're nice bikes. This one's like a 90, 97 or something. Mm-hmm. It's in really nice shape for how old it yeah, is. Yeah, it's clean. Plus, it's got a big bore kit on it, so it's, it's like a 440 or something. It's kind of a cool bike. Um, I've got my KLR in the shop trying to uh, find enough money at some point to fix the parts that I broke over <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> what did you break? Um, I snapped off the rear brake lever. Um or rear, yeah, the rear brake. Uh, he don't need that. Um, well, well there's enough, enough yeah. left. I can kind of get a toe on it, but oh, you have dual discs. I no, you definitely need your I, front <laughs> rear brakes. I crashed I am, it two am, more times because that was missing. Yeah. So well, I that's how I went it. down is because a rear brake wasn't working. That's yeah. how I went down too because I didn't have a rear brake at yeah. all. Yeah. So I got to get that done. Yeah, be safe um, out there. But I'll, I broke some other stuff too. Um, I'm trying to remember what it was. I tore my saddlebags in the oh, forest. No. I got stuck on a tree and ripped a bunch of pieces out of them. Um, I broke something else too. I don't remember what it was. Uh, mainly the brake has made it like that. It's kind of not. Did safe you to ride, ride that up there? No, I had it in my truck. Oh, okay. Um, but I managed to get it stuck like three times on some pretty gnarly trails. I can't help riding it like I ride like a actual dirt bike, and then this thing's like a pig, and I get it stuck in some gnarly stuff. And it's a really heavy bike to have to drag out of yeah. stuff, so I don't like that. But and those crash bars, I had my second set of yeah, Motec crash those. bars that didn't fit again, and they hit the gas tank. So I sent them back, and I really could have used those after three crashes on it. But anyways, um, and then I've got uh, CB five fifty in here, um, Jared's old bike that he had built, and doing a, another wiring harness on that guy. It's a bike I sold to a guy, and then he wanted some work done, and I did the work, and then the wiring harness just happened to start going. It developed problems, a really problems. gnarly problem that is I still am not sure what ultimately was causing it. It's got a really, really weird short somewhere. Um, and then the I got that R90 BMW, got that thing running and just about done um, last week, so that should be out of here soon, hopefully. And... Hopefully I'll have this RMZ 250 out of here soon. Been working on that, but the the motor is just thrashed, and it's a, been a frustrating project. So, uh, anyways, that's what I got going on. Um, let's see. Uh, I have currently uh, the XS 750 is is uh, has gained my attention again. Um, I last week I just finished up, finally got a seat. Um, uh, knocked out and, uh, and we got a design, um, worked out. And so we, um, or, uh, made that and with the help of Jared very generously, uh, since I still am dealing with, uh, um, a broken hand, which I have my brace off now, which is nice. Um, I, the bone is healed. How's your hand doing? The, The bones are healed. It's more so the, um, is it ligaments or tendons that stretch and it could be both, both? um, that, uh, I'm still, it, it's still being very apparent or let me know that it is still, uh, injured. Um, let me see. I mean, it's, it's still swollen. Yeah. Now, but it looks a lot better. Yeah. So I'm able to open up Ziploc bags now, which is nice. And I can crumble paper, which you're, I haven't been able, able to do. You're able to wipe your butt with your right hand? I do with my left anyways. Oh, okay. Well, there um, goes our G rating. And um, <laughs> so it's doing better. Poop I'm, I'm able to uh, have a little bit more movement out of it. I'm still true. being careful with it. Um, and it's P rated. Then um, <laughs> let's see. Yeah, so working on that, there's not too much fab work left. I just have to – I'm waiting on uh, tail light to come in so I can mold that into the, ta- uh, the tail. 
and then um, getting ready for paint for that. Um, the CB550 I've been working on is out of the shop. It is getting tuned by our metric master. Um, our master tuner is uh, going through it, kind of the second set of eyes, or last set of eyes to kind of go through, see if we missed anything. Um, and so getting that ready and prepped for um, for the One Moto Show, uh, we got invited to... Um, to uh, display some of our bikes at the One Moto Show in Portland uh, come February, the weekend of the seventh. So, yeah, pretty awesome. pretty excited about that one. Um, it's uh, it's actually come to think of it, it's not only is it the first motorcycle event that um, I've personally been invited to, but um, I I think actually the only it, it might be the first motorcycle exclusive motorcycle show I'll, I've ever been to. So that'll be exciting. Um, yeah, that's really cool, man. Congrats. Yeah, so that's, that's awesome. Yeah, pretty pumped on that. And so, if you guys are in that area or have the luxury of traveling for it, um, definitely come out to that event. It's gonna be it's gonna be awesome. If you don't know about it, check out one moto um, one moto dot com. The and one sweet number so. one the one um, moto dot com. It's uh, in. Um, what is it's in, in Portland. it's in Portland? PDX is Portland. Oh, sure. I know that. All right, it's in Portland, yeah. February seventh, eighth, ninth. Um, it's going to be a cool show. There's going to be like Avenue. tons yeah. of builders there. A lot like of builders that we look at and follow, like on Instagram and stuff. And yeah, there's tons of tons yeah, of cool stuff going so. on. Um, yeah, and it's cool because it's it's an invite show, invitation show. So it's not like every any person can just kind of go in and bring their bike in there. So it's is it free to go to to like look at bikes? Yeah, you know, I'm not sure on that. Oh, yeah, it says free admission. Oh, free admission. There you I go. might be down to go up there for that. That'd be kind of cool to go yeah. check out bikes and stuff. So um, keep an eye out for that, and um, that's what I got in the shop. Uh. I have the CB550 that I'm working on. Um, I just sent the tank out for paint. Uh, finally came up with the final paint scheme. Um, so that's getting painted right now. All the fab's done. The frame is stripped down. Uh, the bike's stripped down to frame. Um, everything's off in pieces and stuff. And, uh, yeah, so I'm going to probably start paint on Monday for the for the frame and wheels and everything else. But all the fab's done, everything's done. Um, and I'm just trying to get it, got to get it ready for uh, the One Moto Show as well. Um, and I think that's all that I got in the shop right now. It's just that bike. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be cool. Almost done. Looking forward to it. Well, now that we covered all of that, let's talk about building a custom wiring harness. There we go. That was a very long intro segment. Uh, we had a lot of stuff to catch hey, up. Hey, we're with. a little rusty. Okay, yeah. we haven't done this in like three or four weeks. So that was forty-two minutes of um, yeah, nothing in particular. If you're still listening, thank you. Yeah, sorry. Um, now we'll actually give you some useful information. Yeah. Um, so we're going to talk about building a custom wiring harness. We kind of touched on this stuff before, but we had a lot of people ask about going into more detail about it. So. We are, uh, we're gonna try and kind of step through it, um, and hopefully we can help you out if you're doing this yourself. I just recently did a harness from scratch on Brady's, um, CB550 a couple weeks ago, so I guess I'm kinda like up to speed on it, cause I just built one. Um, so I can give some tips for how I did it, um, and I think we can give you some good info because um, just going through doing that bike, um, like Brady kind of comes, he's done tons of them and kind of does it a different way than I do. And they all work, but I think we can give you some different points of view on it. You are totally so. squishing Tom Hanks. Yeah, <laughs> Mel Gibson's just getting crushed. In Dude, there. Tom Hardy is getting <laughs> messed up over there. Yeah. Well, it's not Tom Hanks, but I found a dog last weekend and took him in cause he's a nice guy, but I named him Cole Trickle. After Tom Cruise in Days of Thunder, which I thought was a badass name, you <laughs> but gone with Maverick. turns out like absolutely nobody knows who Cole Trickle is. So like I get all these weird questions and stuff, and they think everybody thinks it's a stupid name. So what about Samuel L. Jackson? 
No, just I, you can call. He doesn't know his name yet, so you can call him whatever you want. He's <laughs> he's got a real low IQ here. Let's so call him like, Evan Junior. You can call him that, whatever you want. Um, all right. So custom harness. Anyways, so we'll start. Um, so this is all going to be under the assumption that. You know, last time we talked about like figuring out. So you got a bike, and you're trying to decide it's got some wiring problems. Do you fix or modify the stock harness, or do you build a custom one? We kind of covered all those situations before. So this is strictly from the point of view that you need to or have decided to build a custom wiring harness for a bike um, because you know you either want to clean it up and have it simplified and you Bare know bones. look nicer or. You know, maybe the old one is just so trash that it makes more sense to start a mm-hmm. new one. But I think keep in mind that if you're going this route, we're going to talk about it in the mindset that you're going to be pretty much simplifying things because if yeah. you're going this route, it's minimal. you know, you're going to be, yeah, you're going to eliminate stuff you don't need. So obviously you could do it way more complex than what we're talking about, but we're going to go at it from the point of view that, you know, you're... You're not building a new stock harness. You're right. building a custom harness for mm-hmm. what the bike is all the components that you've added or taken off and it's tailored to fit the bike. Right. Exactly. Um, so let's start first. We'll talk about materials, um, and tools that you might need to do this. Um, so tools, let's start with tools. Um, I would have a, a good set of, of wire cutters or dikes or whatever you want to call them. Um, it's, I, that's a tool that it's worth buying a nice set. If you're going to be doing yeah. a whole lot of wiring work, um, it totally pays to have a good set that are really sharp and can cut larger gauge wire easily, you know, so you're not, like, sawing at it. Do you like <laughs> those wire ones. strippers that, like... The mechanical ones? The mechanical ones that goes and splits um, it? I They're, love uh, those. I don't use them because I'm so used to... I always strip wire with the cutters, and I just do mm. it quickly. If... You haven't done it a ton, and you're just not fast with it. Then yeah, sure, they work great. I have a set, I just don't ever use I it. I yeah. have used it a couple times, and it's cool and whatever. But I still just prefer to grab my little, you know, the wire yeah. cutters that have the slots for the different gauges, and just oh, and cut it and slide yeah, it off. Yeah, those work too. It's just That's personal preference. Whatever yeah. you like. I I've I didn't get my first pair until maybe like six months ago, and the, I'm, the I'm used. One? Yeah, and I'm used to um, just the regular like electrical pliers or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I just think it's magic every time yeah, I, I do, do it. Too. I, I love the it. Problem I don't with like them. it because I don't. I I can't gauge like where I need to put the wire right, for right. how much it's going to strip off. Right. Oh, I do that and very then easily. You. Um, they also the clamp it's the like clamping mechanism yeah. wears out on them sometimes so they don't hold the wire down tight enough and then it'll, it'll slip. slip yeah so what i, I really think I just like the prefer. major benefit for those is is say you're splicing in like the middle of a wire yes that's nice um, you can you can splice easily it and scoot and it just down. Sque- like uh, right. kind of uh separate it very right. easily um so that I mean that that's the main kind of benefit of it i guess and it's just it's ease, but a lot of times yeah. if you're really getting at it, it can be kind of a chore to like grab them. You have so many different pliers or in your hand you're using, but I love them. I think it's magic every time, and it puts a smile on my face, <laughs> and I feel like I, I'm, I'm witnessing the end of a rainbow. They're they're definitely nice. I mean, it's you know whatever you like. Those those help the kind like Jared was talking about that just have the like kind of slots. In them, you know, like those things work great. Whatever you want, whatever works best. Um, but you know, it like even those ones, uh, like the plier type, like Jared's talking about, like I wouldn't rely on those as your wire cutter though, because they just don't work as well, you know, because they're like a combo, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Well, I if would, you do, I actually because I, I, I primarily use those when yeah. I'm cutting wire. I'm not all the I'm not cutting thick gauge wire all the time, so yeah. I don't need something beefier. But what I have found, there's a bunch of different styles. The one with the cutters on the very end of it um, are much more convenient because you yeah. will be using that a lot of the time right. um, uh, rather than the ones that are kind of on the bottom yeah. of the pivot point those on those. Those are kind of a pain in the ass. Kind of a pain in the ass. I hate that kind, and I like the kind with the, the cutter at the really? pivot point. Really? Oh, got can't okay. stand. Yeah, like, yeah, exactly. No, well, this yeah. is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kind that it's like scissors. You don't – this doesn't have a crimper on it. It's just the cutter and then it's the handle and there's nothing on the hand side of where you grip it. 
and then on the top it has a little spot to cut wire and then it has like 12 gauge or 10 gauge 12 gauge yeah 14 yeah. gauge 16 gauge about, yeah. 18 gauge and then at the very end it's got a little flat spot and that's it and they're this big they're not like the big ones where you can cut it on the underside or yeah they, oh, okay yeah, yeah that's we're fine. talking about more not... of the like standards i guess or standard type of i feel like that wrenches. is a standard one. no no that's exactly like, yeah what Brady's i know what he's talking about style mm. and they're nowhere near as convenient we'll the one pictures. you're talking about works fine yeah. for sure um, anyways, what, it's personal preference, whatever mm-hmm. works best, but there's no shortcut for like a really nice pair of sharp wire yeah, cutters. Definitely. Um, cause you can use them for cutting and for stripping and all sorts of stuff. Um, and then, um, you need so, some soldier. Yeah. You're going to need some soldiers. Um, yeah. A soldiering nice, a nice soldiering iron. There's, um, I kind of <laughs> talked about soldering irons before. There's tons of different styles and you know, the, it's, there's all sorts of options. It's a it's a tool that the more expensive ones you kind of get what you pay for. The nicer soldering iron, the hotter it gets, the faster it heats up, the tips will last longer. Um, I've had a couple of Harbor Freight irons that have burned out in next to no time. I really like um, the butane one that we yeah, all have. I mm-hmm. like that. It um, it's totally useful for like just doing random stuff on the bike it's it's i wouldn't like rely on it for your main one especially if you're going to build an entire harness but you know like they they work they work great i love it i use it all the time yeah. but it's it doesn't it's just not as convenient as having a nice soldering iron when you know you're going to have to make a whole bunch of really good solder joints um <clears throat> and then so you know soldering irons pick a good one there's all sorts of different styles whatever's comfortable i would get one with a higher wattage rating as opposed to the the cheaper um, lower power ones because they definitely don't get as hot and you'll you'll notice the difference um, especially if you're trying to splice more than sometimes you need to join like two wires on one side and one on the other and mm. the smaller irons won't be able to heat up multiple wires as easily um, and then uh, you need to get your wire. Um, I would suggest having at least four or five colors um, so you can kind of plan it out and have different colors for different functions. Mm -hmm. Um, I usually use, um, for your main harness, um, a 16-gauge or an 18-gauge is fine. Um, I usually in the past have used 16. Um, Now I'm kind of going towards using a combination for stuff like the constant hot wire that is going to have more current through it. consistently a 16 gauge is nicer um but for stuff more like accessory type stuff like your turn signals and low wattage brake light especially using leds um 16 or sorry 18 gauge is perfectly fine and when you're bundling multiple wires together the smaller the diameter the you know the cleaner it's going to be be, yeah and you won't have a gigantic bundle so um so i would get you know either 18 or 16 or maybe get your red wire in 16 gauge cuz that will probably be your your hot wire and then 18 gauge for your other colors for the other lights and stuff um it's good to have some 10 or 12 gauge for your battery connections for the high current stuff you definitely don't want to be running your main battery connection or your main ground through anything um smaller than a uh a 12, 12 and i i prefer 10 for the battery connections um and uh you know get decent quality wire like you can get really cheap stuff but the insulation is not very good um it'll have like really cheap plastic insulation on it yeah and you'll be able to feel oh, just kind of sure. the quality of it that stuff when it gets um when it gets old it doesn't even take that long but as it ages like it'll, it'll get really brittle and... it'll crack and you know then then you're open to getting moisture into the wire and once you start as soon as you get moisture into a wire and it starts to corrode and creep up the wire under the insulation that will cause all sorts of problems yeah. and it's it, it's especially when your loom and your harness is all kind of tidied up it's going to be a pain just to try to track that down oh yeah well, I, I mean, that's, what that's one of the reasons you're probably building yeah. this harness is mm. because the old wires have this happening. Um, yeah, you'll notice it when you strip back a wire, and especially an old wiring harness, and you see the wire, instead of being shiny, you know, copper colored, is um, like green, like green like, and crusty. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's bad news. Um, then uh, some other material stuff, um, some 
uh, if you are going to use connectors, you can either hardwire stuff or use connectors for things. If you're going to use connectors, I prefer bullet connectors, uh, like a four millimeter, five millimeter bullet connector um, that you can crimp on. I crimp mm. a man solder them, and uh, and those work well because they actually kind of latch into each other, so they won't pull out. Yeah, super and you want to get the all of your connections you want insulated. Um, yeah, connections. You um, they're they're totally better to get the ones that have the you know some of them have like the uh, heat shrink insulation yeah. built yeah. onto them those are, those are awesome mm. they're more expensive if you're gonna use those, but use they them. are worthwhile i i usually use the the ones that just have a little plastic insulator yeah. on them and then i usually heat shrink over them mm. to cover yeah, exactly it. um but you know what whatever the other ones are nicer but they're they're fairly expensive for yeah. not a very big box of or them. you can order the oem ones too online um what the bullets? Oh, the yeah, the OEM bullets. Oh, okay. And you can and order you can, the OEM, the, all the, like the the blocks the block of the connectors, connectors too. You oh, can okay, order those right online on. too. I mean, if I'm building a custom wiring harness, I I'm on a on a street everything. bike, I prefer to hardwire it because if it's all new and everything's in good condition and it's all built correctly into the right links, you know, there's not really any need to disconnect that yeah. stuff. Um, yeah, and it's it's uh. Uh, say if you're in a, if you're in a position where you are um, trying to hide wires, it's a lot easier to hide that. Right. Um, where connectors uh, on the harness seem to stand out at you pretty quickly right. and draws the eyes toward them. Especially if you're reusing like the stock big block connectors. Oh and yeah, stuff. they take they're very noticeable mm. and they take up a lot of room. Yeah. Um, I would also get uh, heat shrink um, and get. Um, uh, spools of it. Like I go to uh, Fry's Electronics. They're pretty much everywhere, at least down here. And uh, you can get spools of um, probably at least a hundred feet, maybe yeah, more. fifty feet. And they're about I mean, fifteen dollars for mm-hmm. a spool for every different size. So I get them in sizes for like bundles that'll that'll handle one, two, and then like eight. I think is what I size them for wires. And that lets you, you know, cover everything from your Just, uh, single splice. single wires to, yeah, splice to your small, like, two wires going off mm. to a brake switch or something. And then also big enough to cover to sleeve the entire harness. Yeah. So, and most, most uh, um, heat shrink is a uh, one to two or two to one ratio to what shrinks to. So essentially it'll shrink down to half the size uh, it, it uh, appears Really? Does it? Yeah. I didn't like. Does it say that on the box or something? Cause I no. Never knew. I mean, I've there. Always, I've always just like guessed. I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> like. Well, there's different. Um, there's different. I've types. seen that before. Yeah. There's it, some. It tells that, you how much it. Yeah. It'll. Well, that's when bad. I, I never knew. Yeah. That. I usually order from because uh, sometimes I'll order a lot of stuff from McMaster Car. Yeah. Um, and you get from them. I'm sure you can. Yeah, right? they're they're kind of pricey just because they have they ha- well they have. The, the heat shrink that they offer kind of thing, unless right. I haven't found it yet, um, it's kind of – it's like military it's grade, like right. heavy-duty stuff. It's heavy insulated duty stuff. heat shrink. Yeah. And, it's like um, those connectors with the in, – like with the, the insulation. gel right. stuff that comes out. It's like that stuff. Oh, yeah. Huh. Um, and so um, – they and they usually have like the shrink ratio. And most of the time it's, it. it's two to one. Sometimes they have like a four to one where it right, shrinks right. like four times. Ton, yeah. yeah. That's cool. Four yeah. to one would be genius. Definitely. Cause then you um, can fit every, anything. Under yeah. There. But from what I've found yeah. for the most part, like it's even like the cheap crap from Harbor Freight, which I would not recommend, um, is like two to one. So I, I have a bunch of the Harbor Freight heat shrink. It's, it's not bad. The problem is it's it's thin. Like I noticed that that stuff um, is thinner than the stuff I get from Fry's. And mm. a lot of times, if you have a solder joint that has some like kind of spikes mm. on it, so the solder's not it'll totally rip right smooth. Through it. Yeah, yeah, when you shrink it, it'll actually poke holes in yeah. it. Yeah. And I noticed that the stuff that I got from Fry's, I don't know what brand it is, but that stuff doesn't mm. do that. I always. That's something to mention, I guess. Like, if you're doing a solder joint, you want to try and make sure it's all smooth. And if you do have rough spots once File the it. solder dries, yeah, use your clippers, use your wire cutters and clip off the points um, or use a file or mm-hmm. clip it and then file it. But that'll pay off because if you are not careful and you, you know, you can easily have a sharp point poke through 
your heat shrink and then you're kind of right back where you started. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, any other tool type things you can think of? I mean, you don't need a whole lot to yeah. do a job I mean, like this. I, it's uh, what about like wire nuts? Uh, you know, household appliance wire nuts. Oh, yeah. well, I just assume that everybody already has yeah. good stock of those. Um, and some like lamp cord or speaker wire is important. <laughs> uh, I, w- I would suggest, um, like, uh, depending on what you're going to be using or if you decide to tie in like a fuse block or decide to run like inline fuses, uh, those as well. Yeah, um, should have those kind of like the more, already. uh, like, s- uh, cylinder like inline ones. Um, Seem to right. kind of be easier to kind of tuck away to use rather like than a glass them. fuse. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, They're easier to tuck away, but I kind of I prefer always, the blade. Yeah. Ones. I like. The I blade use fuses. the blade ones anyways. But I, but, but I totally agree that like the kind of rectangular housing for a blade fuse doesn't mm. hide is anywhere near as easy. Yeah. As it, as but if you do, but style style does. Does. you want inline fuse one, you could like tuck it up somewhere. Right. Or yeah. But you don't want to make also your entire <laughs> fuse block out of like. Six of them. Yeah. Well, and then at the same time, though, if you're doing when this harness, you're you might have two fuses. You know, I probably right. use one fuse. Yeah, I just right. usually do from one the from the the battery to the right. the switch. Yeah. Um. But um. Hey, and also with this too, I mean, you have complete freedom of where you can place things right yeah. so chances are like somewhere in that line you want to throw a fuse in you can find the spot to tuck it away so right in that case i mean the um the blade fuses are definitely more um uh, are better are better yeah. yeah i mean and because most like a lot of gas stations even carry those if you're on a pinch and need it on the road or right you've blown something and always buy always buy two when you're doing it, or at least always have two on you, so you can put the new one in, turn it on, and it fries again. And right. then you know you have to do something before you put that other one in. Or the trick is just leave extra wire in your harness so that if you do get stranded, you can just strip <laughs> the ends really quick. And, and, and just bypass and it. Bypass and then it, yeah. fry your electronics. <laughs> yeah. We did that. I've done that a couple times, actually. Yeah. Well, And I had also used, if you're going to use a blade fuse, use the large style. Because in a pinch, you can use one of the mini blade fuses in mm-hmm. that holder, and you can't really go the other direction. Yeah. You can. You can put a mini fuse in a big one. Yeah. They'll fit. They're the same. They're not. The they'll, they'll the spin. outside diameter of the mini blade will catch the, the inside, inside mm-hmm. of the large one. So in a pinch, you can fit one of those into a fuse holder for a large one. So, you know. And you can get them in the same current ratings and everything. So yeah. Like, yeah, it's exactly. fine. They just they probably don't fit as like tightly as a large one does, but yeah. I've done that before. Um so, you know, kind of plan that out if you're going to use fuses. Um uh if you're going to use like a junction block for your connections, um like Brady's done on his bikes puts a um like a, a uh, terminal block. a terminal block, yeah, up under the headlight to split out mm-hmm. the hot wire for all the uh different circuits up front and oh. You know, that's that's definitely useful. So plan that out, you know, figure out how many different uh, points you're going to need and you can get the right size or whatever. Um, So, you know, kind of the more homework you do up front about what you're going to need. Obviously, if you haven't built one before, it might be kind of difficult to guess everything you're going to need. But draw it out on paper. Yeah. And like lay it out. It definitely helps me. Um, But that brings us to the next point is. You got to do. You got to prep for it. So when right. you're building a harness, you don't want to build your harness before your bike is done, right? Um, especially if you're doing custom build, because well, especially if you're going to hardwire things, then yeah, that's yeah. like one of the last things. Like that's after paint. That's the last and that's, thing that I that's do during too. final assembly. So, and the reason being is you want all your components to be where they're going to be, right? So that you can tailor your harness mm. to be exact lengths and not have extra wire looping around and doing whatever yeah because it's part of a custom harness so. yeah and also i mean it starts even before that because as you're say if you're doing the custom build you want to be thinking about where how you're going to run your wiring harness while you're doing this yeah. while you're fabbing things right that way you don't have to when you get to wiring and when you have a freshly painted bike it's like shit I have got to I got to drill a yeah. hole right here. It's I've got to cut a little piece out so I can channel this this wire through. Um and uh and at the same time too, I mean you're kind of you're prepping yourself for your actual wiring harness cuz you're kind of somewhat mapping it in your head while you're you're doing it. 
Um, so definitely keep that in mind well before you actually get to doing the wiring harness. Right. Um, so kind of in along that same topic, like, so obviously, like we said, figure out every component you're going to have in the system and make sure you already have a place for them and they're mounted in their permanent, maybe they're not permanently mounted, but you know where their final resting place is going to be so you can size it accordingly. So that being said, figure out exactly what you're going to keep, um, you know, what you want from the stock harness and the stock electronics, what do you want to reuse um, on your bike? So if you've got an electric start bike, are you going to keep the electric starter? Uh, are you're you going to go, go kick, kick only? Kick only? Um, think about, so what are you going to do as far as uh, the lights? Do you want to keep the handlebar switch with turn signals and high low beam? Or do you just want to have the headlight on constantly? Uh, not be able to select between high and low. Um, or do you want to have a headlight on off switch in your headlight shell? Right. You know, like just mount it on there. So that's all those decisions need to be made up front before you start cutting wire. So, you know, um, you know how you're going to configure it. Um, if you are going to use the electric starter, do you want to use the stock handlebar switch with the stock kill and start button? Or do you want to put, you know, relocate all that? Do you want to relocate the kill or the key switch? Um, you know, you got to figure all that stuff out ahead of time. Exactly what electronics on the bike you're going to reuse uh, or can you know continue to use, and then if you're going to relocate any of them. So all that stuff's got to be planned out first. Um, do you guys want to talk about like what do you? recommend if you know i guess it's kind of hard to say because it really depends on what you want to yeah. do so i guess we can um, just like kind of just pick an example and just go with it well i mean so the things that you need for like so say you're doing it's bare bones and you're keeping your electric start and right um well let's use the cb 750 that we did for an example uh, 550 or 550 yeah mm-hmm. so that bike had an electric starter um we dumped uh the original handlebar switches we still had turn signals um we did not need a high low beam switch the headlight was just going to be on high beam anytime the key was on um and then we had a brake light and used only the front brake lever uh switch for the brake light so that's that's pretty simple. I mean, that's that's pretty bare bones. Like mm-hmm. that's the pretty much the minimum lighting stuff you need to be street legal. No, um, no horn. That's another thing I didn't mention. Um, so, like in that case, you know, that's that's. Well, actually, I think no horn isn't street legal. But yeah, yeah but well, you're never gonna get pulled over yeah, for, right, it. <laughs> for it. So, like in that case, you know, once you've got all that stuff planned out, then you can start figuring out um, how how to start building your harness um the you kind of need to let me think if i can think how to start describing this the first things i would figure out um so you know where you're going to mount your battery obviously you got to have that ruled or figured out you need to figure out where you're going to mount your charging system components your um we'll go under the assumption you're changing to a single regulator rectifier unit um and once you have that stuff done you can, um, I would start by running your battery connections, figure out where you're going to have a nice solid frame ground, um, figure out exactly where your battery is going to be mounted. Um, if you're using the electric starter, you're going to have your starter solenoid. So you need to figure out where that goes. And then I would get those guys out of the way. So you know where your large wires are going to go first. Cause those, you know, are bigger than pretty much all the mm-hmm. others. Um, once that's done, the first place, so once you've got the, your ground and your battery supply to the starter solenoid taken care of, you kind of have like the backbone laid out. So then the next critical thing to run is your, um, ignition, your ignition. Yeah. Your hot wires. So, well, and like I would be doing this on paper, like I would have all your things in place right? and then I would just like kind of. In my mind, envision a bike from left to right, left being the tail and right being the headlight yeah. or vice versa, however you want to work it, and just kind of place the battery on the piece of paper about where it is on the bike yeah, and then exactly have your ignition right. switch where it is kind of on the bike and kind of lay it out visually like that. That's how I work. Right. Um, I get a big piece of 
I've got that big notepad down there. Yeah, and like I lay a big it out, yellow notepad, and then I draw all the components out first. Yeah. In, in the same general location on the paper that they are as I'm looking at the bike from the side. That's exactly. And then what I'm once saying. that's all done, then I start sketching in where I want you know what making wires my you main need. connections, mm-hmm. and you kind of build off of it from there. So I draw in my battery connections in the ground, and then I draw in uh, the hot wire going up. Uh, from the you know up to the key switch and then supplying the junction block or up at the headlight where I'm then going to branch off all the other hot circuits. Yeah. Um, so I guess it's kind of hard to like describe that stuff without anybody looking at a picture of it. But the key I think is to plan it out ahead of time. You mm. can find a million examples of wiring of simplified wiring diagrams online. Um, there it's you know once you understand how each component works yeah that's the big that thing is, um, i i definitely um would stress is figuring out exactly what each wire i've said it multiple times i think throughout this this podcast series is if you don't know what it is look at each wire right. that comes and spans off of it and figure out exactly what it does and why it does that cuz then it makes it so much easier then it's like almost like oh well mm, duh that's right. exactly why yeah, it's there yeah exactly you can visualize it in your head pretty quickly once you know what each component like i guess you, you cuz you can't even really do this if you have your starter solenoid and it has four connections but you don't know what they do yeah. if yeah. you don't know what that does you can't even begin to figure out how to hook it up so i guess that's totally key is the first thing to do is any components that you don't know like you know what connections or what color wires come off of them but you don't know how it works go find out and understand what each wire or connection on that component does Mm. and once you have that all drilled into your head and and draw it on your diagram you know like i make little pictures of it like for my turn signal switch like i draw a little square and then draw my input and then my two switch options and then the wires coming out Mm -hmm. and then i've got a easy like visual way to look at it and know you know and i note what color wire i'm going to use for it and once you kind of draw out a map it's really simple to go make those connections um so you know i guess from there like you really just i would do do your research first understand the components make a drawing and then you really just start wire by wire and laying it out on the bike is Mm -hmm. you know once you've got your sketch down you just pick your your you pick the stuff that's going to be the most common i guess first off like your constant hot wire or your switched hot wire like that's kind of your backbone so you lay that down first and then you know you kind of cut it to your general length so i usually leave myself like plenty of extra wire on either end and I cut it and then I kind of lay it on the bike. I usually keep a couple rolls of electrical tape and then I can just kind of tape wires in place to the frame um, and keep them hanging there because it it's a lot easier for me like I'm like really hands-on and visual when I'm doing it so it helps for me to cut the wires longer than I need them lay them on the bike kind of tape them in place and then get my next one lay it out, kind of route it to where the connection's going to be, tape it, or, and then I start taping them together and kind of build a little mm. bundle as I go. And if you do it that way... Yeah, and definitely um, kind of mark also with um, uh, either with tape or uh, you probably with tape yeah. is like where, say, a wire is going to splice off right, and right. lead a different direction. That, and that blue way when painting you, tape, you know? That, you yeah. can, that stuff works great because it doesn't leave residue and mm. you can... Write on it with a sharpie and like yeah. I believe it's called painter's tape. Mm. Well, it's or blue, blue masking blue tape. Masking tape. Yeah, because you can't use the green or the red. So I was just kidding. I like I don't. Do uh, I don't know. I, yeah. You guys are yeah, looking at me like I'm. Is there more? <laughs> well, masking tape is the, just <laughs> you, masking tape is white. You both had yeah. the same like blank look on your face. <laughs> like what the fuck are you talking? About? Um, get out of uh, here, Tom Skerritt. <laughs> Dude, that's Tom not Solik. his name. <laughs> Tom Skerritt. Isn't that the guy yeah. um, from... Uh, it's Goose. No, no, no. It wasn't... Um, no, he was like the Admiral guy on Top Gun. The guy who, like, when when he said that he was, like... The guy that said your mouth's right and checks your body can't catch. That's who Tom Skerritt was. I think Tom Skerritt was Goose. I don't think so. Oh, my phone's dead. Look it up. All right. No, it, we can do this after. Wait, you guys keep talking. Um, okay, so... <laughs> I mean, I guess this is a little more difficult than I thought it was when we talked about going deeper in depth on a 
on a custom harness. Um, oh, bam. No. Told you he's the admiral. Look at that. Okay, you're right. Yeah, and you know what? Your mouth's right in checks. Your body can't catch. It is. <laughs> I'm so broke right now. It's insane. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I will um, – I'm going to make um, – I've got a diagram. It's really rough, but I have a diagram on the computer from – the harness from that CB. So I can easily put that up on the website so you can see an example of like what my sketch looked like. Mm. And um, you could probably get a good idea of how to go from there. Um, Another thing um, also, this is something that I've done. Um, I, uh, like Evan mentioned earlier, I tend to, I prefer using like the terminal block style of routing things. Uh, just because it's like a central location, I can run things and like I don't have to figure out or worry about where I'm going to splice into this hot fi- uh, this hot wire or this main feed. Um, and another thing too, well, that makes it way easier to build it as you go. Like yeah, if you have that exactly. one junction place, you run your hot wire mm. to it, and then you can add your next ones coming off from it one at a time. Yeah. So and that's, that's and totally definitely a good I way think to go. the biggest thing uh, or biggest issue with doing a from scratch harness definitely at first or your first time doing or your first few times is the overwhelming feeling you get by doing it <laughs> yeah, because yeah. you've been staring at sure. this this piece of paper that looks like spaghetti in your head now that's a diagram and you walk away from it it's like okay what the fuck do I do now Yeah and it kind of gives you that, just like in writing, like it's that first sentence is the hardest one to lay down. But once you lay that down, it just starts, you start bullshitting away. The, and the number one thing is you take it, you take it step by step and component by component. Yeah. And as it's really cool as you're building something like this and you get each piece to work, like you get the horn working, you know, mm-hmm. Hey guys, and check like, it out. Nothing beep, else beep, beep. works, but yeah. like you, you can turn the key switch on and then beep the horn. You're like, mm-hmm. Oh sweet. So like I got the horn and you can start checking stuff off your diagram as you just got to attack it one by one. Yeah. And, and really if you go through it that way, you might find out that in the end, um, you really have like duplicated stuff. You've added a bunch of extra wires that don't need to be there. Mm. Like, is it, that's the way, like, like uh like well, that's doing, the way you learn like doing that cb like with the junction block there like it, so i lay the whole thing out and i split everything off of the junction block for all the different wires and then when i'm done i step back and look at it and, like everything works fine but really i have there's nothing wrong with it but i end up with like six or seven extra wires yeah that don't need to be there because i could really just if i'm hardwiring everything they can all be soldered just together yeah, you exactly. know? not not six or seven but mm-hmm. you know what i mean like when you're done you can actually go back um that's the good way like when you're doing this kind of from scratch and you're laying out all these separate wires and everything well once you're done and you have everything hooked up and working then you can go back and simplify stuff you mm-hmm. know splice those wires together instead of having all these extra connections or you know then once everything works you can route it a little differently or you know, whatever, but it's, uh, when you're doing it this way, it's cool. Cause you have full control over how it ends up. So you can totally modify it or change everything once you have each component working correctly. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and maybe, maybe it's not needed, but kind of continue on where I was, where I was going with, uh, a moment ago is when say like, for instance, when I do the terminal block where everything leads off of that, um, it makes it a lot easier to uh, separate as far as, like, say I do a one sheet of paper. I'll write down, this is my diagram for my lighting. So I'll run from just, like, one, say, like, the hot number, number two on the terminal block is a lighting. So I'll run all of that um, based off of that. And so you're just li- listing off. Um, say the, the, uh, routing to the headlight, then down to the tail light, and then, um, your, blinkers, if you your have them. yeah, your blinkers were, and then we're like, and also including like the switch, like the switch, but the mm-hmm. relay boxes and then, um, the actual switch, um, and, uh, the brake, um, uh, was a brake, uh, trigger or a sensor. When the brake lights switch. on, the brake the switch. switch. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> and uh, so then you have like, okay, this is my wiring, or this is my wiring diagram for my headlights. And then okay, here's the charging system. You do the charging system, and then you do 
um, the ignition system, and mm-hmm. then you move on to the next. So you separate it, and then so you're not looking at like all of these systems right, right. going into one page on a diagram. You can separate, it and it's like, okay, this is something I can chew and swallow, and I'll do this. Yeah. And you can make, say, you can make three different harnesses that each yep. system is attached to. That's a good point. And uh, it might actually, for first starting off, it might be an easier or and safer way for you to do it because, say, the headlight's not working. It's like, okay, I don't have to dig through this entire harness you I just attached to go together, to just this one. Right. Um, you know what? So, I mean, in my, in my recommendation, I think this is an easier way to kind of get started on it. And then you can kind of... Uh, when you get comfortable doing uh, maybe a few more or you just want to go back and redo it and just kind of keep learning and kind of trying new things, uh, doing like kind of one solid loom or harness that everything is connected to and it's fed off and it's kind of more um, uh, kind of intertwined together. No, you're you're so, 100% right. You should that, that totally makes, do it that way yeah. from the start. And that you know what? You, I actually – back. You go back later – once it's all done and you have all these separate pieces working correctly, mm. then you go back and, and simplify it at the end once all that's yeah. done. But, yeah, if you bite it off in chunks and get each system working correctly mm. on its own. Yeah, and it's, and it's exactly good, it's good it. with kind of setting goals for yourself too. I mean right. if you're goal-driven, or goal, uh, driven, say, okay, today I'm going to knock out the lighting on this wiring system. Right. And then the first time you do it, it's going to take a long time. Yeah. Yeah, it still gonna... takes me three to four days yeah, to, say, knock out, and then I give an extra couple extra days just because I forgot something or, yeah. or whatnot. So um, I actually have written out exactly what I explained to you. Um, I, um, I'll try to, it's, they're at the shop, at my shop, or we're, our shop. I'll, I'll try to take some what, photos. Some diagram? Yeah, where yeah, I have that, written out, and like, it's cool. pretty simply laid out. If you guys want to use them, you're more than welcome to, and add on to it, or change some things. Even I've changed a few things since I've written those out, what I normally wire things up, so. Yeah, and you know what? Now that you say it that way, cause I've, I've looked at your diagrams mm-hmm. that you have, and in my head, I was like, why the hell does he do it this way? But I never put it together that you're using that terminal block. Yeah. And now that you say it like that, mm-hmm. it's like it makes so much sense. Mm. I mean, I probably still wouldn't do it that way, but it makes sense that you're doing like the, yeah. you know, that makes sense how you're doing. Mm-hmm. That's see no, I cuz hearing yeah, I think the same thing cuz hearing you explain it like that, then I that, now I see why yeah, you use I'm the terminal for block. It. That makes yeah. 100% mm-hmm. sense. I'm I've always just been because I can visualize it in my head really easy. So I think of the end result, and it's like, why do that extra work? But then, yeah. really, if you're sitting down and, and and like when you're actually building it, like, uh, anyways. Long story short, yes, that makes much more sense to go through it that so, way. And yeah. especially for the new guy that like hasn't done this before, because this is probably one of the most overwhelming things you can do. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna if definitely. You've never done it. It's and gonna take you a long time to get it wrong the first time. Yeah, and then <laughs> I gotta tell it. you, once you knock one of these out and like you have it all sleeved up and everything, oh, and it yeah. fits the bike perfectly, and you're just like, "Holy shit! I just built that from scratch." Exactly. It's oh, a pretty that's damn another good thing. Feeling. Think ahead when you're doing your shrink wrapping. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've soldered something together and then said, "Shit, there's yeah. no shrink wrap there." Yeah. And you gotta unsolder if you want to do it the right way. Unsolder it, mm. sleeve it, and then do it again. Yeah. Or like big sections of harness where you have shrink wrap on one side and shrink wrap on yeah. the other side but it's split off and then you just have this section in the middle it's like damn it <laughs> yeah and what definitely do do definitely that's don't that's when I just throw electrical yeah, tape on it definitely yeah, don't a start place for electrical tape yeah exactly and I have like say forgotten to put shrink wrap over like soldering two wires together and I'm like screw it I'm just throwing some yeah, electrical tape around this yeah sometimes you need to mm-hmm. you totally need to and that's um, fine you just don't want to Spiral wrap the entire yeah <laughs> yeah definitely um, so definitely I I would put everything sleeve everything through uh, electric or I'm sorry uh, uh, heat shrink before you even start to think about putting fittings on or, or connectors on any of the ends of the wire yeah um, that way you know okay um, this is this is ready for me to start assembling kind of thing. You did all the prep work and then including in that prep work is sleeving everything. Right. You can't always do sleeve everything but get the majority and bulk of it. Um, that way, uh, say if you did forget a few things, it's one or two spots rather than right. 10 or 15 spots that are wrapped in electrical tape that's always going to be in your bag of head. If something goes wrong, that's one of the spots. And use, I like we talked about 
picking out your wire colors and stuff at the start, but that's I just want to like go back over that. That's really really important that you use different wire colors for different functions because if later on you need to troubleshoot anything or even once you're done and you, you know say you laid everything out now you got to take it off the bike and sleeve it and everything if you don't you know if you use the same color for everything mm. it's going to be a nightmare trying to remember what oh, wire yeah. goes where and to if ever you really anything. if you really have to you can get away with doing a uh, red and we're doing the whole thing with red and uh, or like two different colors yeah. uh one's one that's like kind of hot and ground Especially, it's a lot easier if you do, say, the system I was talking about earlier, where you mm-hmm. have separate harnesses yeah. for each oh, yeah. different system. Right. You can get away with doing it, too. I The only other, actually, for when I do it, the only other two color wires are the left and right blinkers. Um, and those are my, my green and yellow. And then everything else is black and red, and that signify, or, or, um, signifies it's a, a hot it's wire. power and hot and ground. Yeah, or a ground wire. If you do use two colors, like I've done that before, and I will use... You can make two colors of wire into four colors by putting little bands of electrical tape yeah. around them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you have a black and a red, and then you have a red with a black tape stripe and a black with a yeah, black tape definitely. stripe. That lets you, you know, all, all that really matters is that you know. You know and which one goes it where. Will just trust us on this. It will save you <laughs> a lot of time if you have some sort of a key for yourself so you know what is what. Yeah. Um, um, and obviously, if you can use separate colors for everything, that is ideal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, even if it's just um, like when it's if it's say you're wiring like sourcing everything to like connecting everything in the headlight. If you're con- using connectors, like just put a little piece of little masking tape or something with like just HL for headlight yeah. or write it out. Whatever whatever works best for you, so you know which ones will wh- which which uh, wire leads where. Yeah, for the most part, if all this stuff's new, you're not going to have problems for a long time. But mm-hmm. if you do, you know, make it as easy on yourself as possible yeah. for, you know, you in two years. Yeah, <laughs> If you definitely. keep the bike. <laughs> um, um, what do you think about brake switches? Like, do you prefer to just use... I think you do, right? You just use one, like you just use the front brake. You know, it, it kind of varies. Like the reason I didn't use the, um, like say on the CB uh, 550 that you are, the reason I didn't use the rear uh, brake switch. Um, that's uh, the little, usually that little the switch, and then it's connected to the brake pedal with the, the spring. spring. Um, if uh, some like on that one, it's mounted on the outside, yeah. and then a lot of them also are mounted on the inside of the frame. But it's mounted on the inside. I'll have no problem mounting that. Um, the only problem no with problem, those is they, they, the mechanical ones like that fail a lot more mm-hmm. often than the, the like front brake switch type. Yeah. And um, they also have to be adjusted because they, they'll they begin to wear they the stretch. contacts yeah. inside. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. they'll stretch. The spring will stretch. And then you need to reset. Um, they usually have a little uh, like a... A nut on them basically that lets you raise them up to reset yeah, the tension. Yeah, and it's usually all plastic, so it's yeah. not like it's it's a locked in thread. No, but um, they break. I've seen the, the threads yeah. break, the mm-hmm. nuts break, um, and then you'll you can also they can fail in two different ways. They can fail so they will never close the connection anymore, mm-hmm. and then they can also fail so they're always closed. Yeah. and it can be just kind of a confusing thing to troubleshoot because. You know, your brake light might be on all the time and, and you'll think that your brake light doesn't work. You'll think that just the running tail light mm. is on all the time. Really, your brake is just you know, always, always, always and on. It's always on. Yeah. So it's just, you know, little things like that. Like the little, the front switches are probably more reliable in the long run yeah. than the mechanical rears. But yeah, for the most part, I mean, if you, if your riding style, if you brake with the, the front and rear, um, you probably should, um, anyways, during normal riding conditions, of course, like track riding and stuff like that, you can utilize and isolate front and rear braking, uh, for different reasons, but, uh, chances are, uh, that's not the, not the case. Um, and, uh, also on, uh, reliability of, uh, brake switches, uh, the ones that are usually line, uh, the switches that are in line with the, um, brake lines, uh, like say the block that like either acts as a splitter or just, oh, yeah. um, yeah, the, pre- I, the pressure switch. The pressure yeah, switch. Yeah. Uh, in my experiences, they have not, they're not very reliable, 
Um, usually, uh, just because they haven't moved in so long that right. it's just not, it's just seized. Um, so, um, if it is working, uh, just make sure it's always, uh, being operated. Otherwise it will right. start to just not work for you anymore. Yeah. Usually the, the little triggers are on the, uh, on the brake master cylinder or brake lever. Um, those will be the most reliable ones. They're newer, um, newer kind of technology. If you are, um, I mean, as simple as just kind of a connect to disconnect. It's more of a modern, uh, style of a brake switch. Um, and, uh, um, you can also get pressure switches that replace the banjo bolt. Oh, really? Yeah. You know? Cause they, they use them on like dual sport bikes all mm-hmm. the time. So when it's you've a got a banjo bolt with a pressure switch in it, exactly. And it has two leads that come out. They oh, make cool. them in the that. thread style for, Almost every like the Nissan calipers and the yeah. Brembo, like they make them for almost every popular brand. Isn't there? An, there's another one. Um, the anyways, N-S, uh, something or other oh, more Nissan, calipers. Nissan, but there's one other. Oh, and on the Japanese, I can't remember. Anyways, they make them in the thread pitch for just about every. There's mm-hmm. only two or three common styles. Yeah, and you can get them. They're usually sold for uh, dual sport for dirt bikes, but those work really well. Um, I've never put you one on an older bike, but I'm sure you could. Yeah. There's actually one on the 550. I'm not using it, though. On the rear? On the new 550, that my build right now, there's one on the master cylinder. Oh, that's cool. I, I might have seen. Yeah. Oh, cool. I so, might have yeah, seen what you guys are talking about. I just can't bolt. think it of comes it. comes out of the banjo I've bolt, got yeah. one on that bike down there. You can look, yeah. look at the rear. You'll I'll see exactly what I mean. They're they're cool. They work really well, and they're simple. I guess you could put that anywhere, though. Like You could put it at the splitter. Yeah. And then run your lines out of there instead of using the pressure switch. Yeah. That's actually a great idea because then you don't have to worry about that pressure switch going bad or failing on you. Right. Yeah, and it's or a lot easier to – short like we found on that bike. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, it's probably a lot easier to hide those wires kind of too. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you're having two wires come f- or go to the brake switch. So um, – or to the uh, ma- uh, brake master. One switch. other thing we didn't talk about is what if you're going to use your – what if you want to reuse your stock gauges? So that's something that takes a little bit more planning if you're going to use the stock gauges on a bike and you still want to use all the like indicator lights mm-hmm. or warning lights and fun well, it's and not, stuff. Well, it's not really I mean, that much. You just got to – because your neutral light and your oil light are the only two lights that come out of your – they come out of your engine. Yeah. So you're just going to keep those. When you hardwire everything, you're just going to add a color for your neutral light. Yeah. You're going to mm-hmm. add a color for your oil switch and you'll just run that up with your stuff and then – those switches are just um, – they just connect to positive. So one right. lead goes – so the colored one is like the ground basically. Um, and then the other side that comes out of it, you just connect to your switch to hot. Yeah. And so you just have to make – it's just a lot of branching off yeah. inside your headlight bucket or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's just include that on your diagram if it's something you're going to use. It does mm-hmm. get – it gets tricky when you're like writing it out and thinking about it. It's like a headache but – once you figure it out and plug it in, it's like, oh, that's simple. Yeah, they make like it, all of those the relays. The stock harnesses make it way more difficult than it yeah. has to be. Pretty much the thing about like those uh, those uh, little switches on the motor, uh, the your it's pretty much just a switching switching on and off a of ground. Yeah, yeah. And so, and uh, most switches that's will trigger. That's basically how every switch on these bikes works. Yeah, it's switching it's on and off ground. Like most, when you think of it, like turning the switch on, you're like connecting the positives to it. It's it's just you're connecting and closing that circuit or closing that connection with the ground instead of uh, instead of your positive. Um, your stock, the diagram, the stock schematic and the owner's manual or whatever will show you how those operate. And if you can't figure it out, you can also use a multimeter and yeah. figure it out. Although, well, mm. you got, I mean, to fig, you, got, you would have to I trigger guess, cause it. You got to start the bike yeah. or whatever to test your oil switch. And, yeah. Anyways. But hey, if not, I mean, the bike will still run and it might just be another thing to worry about or make your decision if you want it or not. So, yeah. um, but let's see. I think that probably covers most of the stuff we can Hopefully think we of. we helped you out. Um, I mean, we'll, yeah. we'll it was put a little up, more difficult than I thought it was going to be. It always is. Yeah. It's, I think well, that's, it's a really visual thing, so mm-hmm. it's kind of hard to get a ton of information across by talking about it. But I think – We'll we'll kind of put together a collection of a bunch of different like diagrams and pictures and stuff to put on the website. And I think if you can look at 
We'll try and find some good materials. If you can look at that stuff and listen to this, it will probably be fairly easy to understand. Yeah. So, and I'll, uh, when I get into the shop next, I'll, I'll, I might be in there tomorrow night. Uh, well, regardless, I'll get there before this, this, uh, is um released i'll try to get at least if if um take pictures of them with your phone or something yeah if the the kind of um style of wiring with the terminal block um if anyone feels that that might be like kind of a route better for them um i'll have uh i'll take some photos of the wiring diagrams that i've used that kind of has them all separate and uh, get those to evan so he can post them Take pictures um, and email them to me. Yeah, or? and you could use that to say remove some things or modify, add things, yeah. um, or just kind of look at it as a reference. It's like, okay, I it's possible to do something like this and then go off and do your own that makes better sense to you. Yep. So sometimes it just takes like okay, this can be done, and now let me do it how what that uh, that seems best fit for me. Because well, it's kind of one of those things that's like. <laughs> There's, uh, like when you put in an address, like to get directions to, like, say through, uh, like Google Maps or something, it gives you, uh, your starting point and your end point, but three different routes to get there. Uh, they're all gonna get there. It's not like a right way, it's whatever way that you choose to go. As is life. <laughs> That's a nice deep. Analogy. That was deep. That was real deep. Um, <laughs> well, Tom well, Selleck kind of gave me the inspiration as he. <laughs> Tom Scarrett really is all for it. Well, bottom line, it can be done. You can do it. You just got to put in the time and learn it. And I guarantee you, once you do one, the others will. Yeah. It'll click. They only get mm-hmm. easier. By the time you finish one, it'll click and you will be able to do them much, yeah. much faster and simpler. And proof of that is when I did my first wiring harness, or my first two actually, I wanted to rip the walls off of my house yeah. uh and now uh i actually kind of enjoy doing it it's it's like one of those moments where i can just kind of as it like when i'm cleaning carbs or something like that i can just kind of hang out and just relax and, yeah. and just start I start working the worst the part about just like harnesses for me is hurting my back from just sitting on the stool and like leaning over and soldering for yeah. hours. Like, that's why I you like get doing a it. lift <laughs> so you can stand next to it. And it's so well, we have, easy. we have, uh, we have lifts. Well, not lifts, but they're we like have stands. We, have stands. we just Dude, don't use them. You guys should go get one of those from Harbor Freight, man. That we don't have room. Awesome. Yeah. We need to do some serious organizing in the shop. All right. It's we are pushing out. an hour and 36 minutes. So thanks for listening. Yeah, I hope thank this you helped. so much. And Give us your feedback on this and let us know if we can clarify anything. And let us know if you guys have ideas for, uh, yeah. for shows. Oh, there yeah. was uh, – I did briefly see a comment about uh, carb tuning. Uh, we definitely will be doing an episode on carb tuning probably in the future. I'd say like within two to four episodes. Yeah, that would be cool. Um, I think we, we kind of, not necessarily been following a certain, like, kind of build, uh, schedule. build schedule, but um, there's a few more things that we probably want to get through and explain um, if needed or not to kind of get to that tuning point. tuning guy come in and... and no. No. This will be a four-hour yeah. podcast. Oh, no. <laughs> All right. Um, he's an awesome guy. No, I mean, you know, he's extremely dad. knowledgeable. A lot of detail. Um, but... Um, yeah, so I think, uh, um, yeah, that covers it. Well, we'll give, us, it give us some feedback and ideas. Check out um, MotorbikeMondays.com if you're listening to this on iTunes and get in touch with us. Um, we are also always looking for advertisers, people to participate, product reviews, um, anything. If you want to get involved, um, shoot us an email. We'd love to have some guests. If you own a shop, you're a mechanic, you know what you're doing. Um, you know, it participation's good. So we're doing this to yeah, talk to people. So if you want to get involved, hit us up. We'd love to have more people, um, you know, to the show. talk with. Yeah, and thanks for sticking through uh, with our extended break. Yeah, yeah. we'll be back on. Uh, we'll normal be back schedule. on on an actual schedule. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right, right guys. take care, guys. Thanks. See ya. Bye.